Well, thanks to all of you for coming on this cold January day to celebrate uh, ideas, old and new. Thanks to President Symbolic, who has invited me to address this convocation, and also to my host, Sister Matthias Sterner, and also to a lifelong friend and colleague, Sister Barbara Finan. So we're approaching noon on this day. In another four or five hours, the night will begin to move across North America. And tonight, as every night, powerful instruments of research, receiving radio and light waves, will examine stars in galaxies far, far away. It will examine stars, however, in a new way. How? Since 1995, which is not so long ago, over 700 planets have been discovered outside of our solar system. In these months, sometimes in one month alone, 30 new planets are discovered. We have entered into a new world, a truly vast universe. The telescopes around the world are searching for what are called exoplanets. NASA has launched a telescope, Kepler, to study 155,000 suns to find exoplanets. North of San Francisco, a radio telescope with 42 dishes has been set up, but it will have 350 dishes when the Allen Telescope Array is complete. One of its main purposes is to look for planets in outer space and for life in outer space. Two years ago, a new telescope in Europe began the examination of 120,000 stars. Almost every month, some research center finds exoplanets. Last year in Paris, the Institut pour l'Astrophysique offered the hypothesis that there are more planets than stars in a galaxy. So in our Milky Way then, there would be billions of such planets. A theologian would not presume to decide whether there are other intelligent beings in the universe. Neither theologians nor astronomers should dictate to the creator, to the divine intelligence and power, what it can or cannot do. How many stars in one galaxy 15 or 20 years ago, when I, as a complete amateur, began to read about this topic, the estimate was that there were maybe 500 million stars in one galaxy. That estimate rose upward to, to 5 billion, then to 10 billion. Now the estimate is there's 100 billion to 200 billion stars in one galaxy. So many galaxies, each with billions of solar systems, these numbers raise the possibility, the likelihood of worlds with intelligence. Some years ago, a group of scientists produced an exercise in probability, the Drake equation. This is only an exercise in probability. It doesn't prove anything from data. It looks at the percentage of galaxies with the right kinds of stars suited to forming planets. And then it takes the smallest percentage of that. And then from that small percentage, it takes the percentage of planets hospitable to life. And then from that small percentage, it takes the smallest percentage of those suited to animal life. And then the smallest percentage of planets suited to animal life and to see that they might be suited to intelligence. In terms of the Drake equation, the astronomer Michael Lemonick writes, if the average civilization does in fact endure for between 1,000 and a million years, so this would be a, a civilization of extra intelligent extraterrestrials, then the number of communicating civilizations in one galaxy would be between 1,000 and a million. This would just be in one galaxy, perhaps 
in ours. Does the Christian faith insist that only one salvation history exists or can exist? Does religion on earth, all the different religions, insist that salvation history can only exist once? The one recorded in the Bible. Is Jesus so central a figure that only he and his Middle Eastern religious world can reveal God to intelligent believers? The subject of our quite speculative theology this morning is creatures living on other planets orbiting other suns. To be involved with the divine, the creature needs to have intelligence and be free. So we're concerned here with intelligent beings in our material universe. Extraterrestrials have some form of body, some matter. So we're not concerned with beings without corporeality, with spirits, or traditionally called angels. Matter and spirit and intelligence. There might be countless forms of animal and vegetable life in the universe. We are interested in them if they have mind and freedom. Recently, somebody sent me a cartoon, and in the cartoon of this very advanced spaceship is a family of extraterrestrials, parents and two children. And the little girl says, when we get home, are we still aliens? Are there intelligent creatures in galaxies far, far away? Are there only a few of them? Are there many of them? Three topics, I would suggest, are constant and basic in all of religion. They are very much the subject of the Christian faith, but they're the subject pretty much of all religions. The first topic is the knowing person. So, what are we like? The second is the person's special relationship to God. And thirdly, sin and evil. This triad is the way in which human beings on earth ponder what is called religion. The triad seems to me to be the first place to start when you're thinking about the problem we're looking at this morning. First of all, the knowing person. Carl Sagan observed, there's no reason to think there's only one path to intelligent life. The selective advantage of intelligence is clearly high. We on Earth should be open to a variety of creatures, creatures we can barely imagine or glimpse or unusual but who have intelligence. For Christian faith and theology, the nature of other intelligent creatures, when they exist, would be open to variations. Like everything in the universe, their forms come from a divine wisdom and love that are its only limits. The universe itself suggests the possibility of varied ways of life, of intelligent life, because it is so vast. For instance, the inhabitants of a planet around a distant sun, their personal and social and also religious life might be timeless. The divine presence would dwell among the people without any story or without any history. Christianity, of course, places at the heart of religion stories and history. Time does not lie in these extraterrestrials happy nature. Second principle in the triad, grace. Christian faith, in fact, is not about God's existence. It's about God's life as touching human beings in a special way. That special contact with God, Christians call the kingdom of God, as Jesus did, or life in the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul did. In this regard, Christianity poses a further question. Do intelligent creatures draw forth from God from God's free plan for them, some special expression of God's love for them, a special presence of God. That's what Christianity believes is at the heart of its revelation. Does God relate in a personal and loving way only to us on earth, divine interior life? But there might be all kinds of modes of supernatural life 
with God. A variety of intimate ways in which God contacts intelligent and free creatures in a billion galaxies. Is it likely that there are millions of bands on the spectrum of natural life, but only one form of grace or the kingdom of God or created supernatural life? After all, a spiritual and graced existence is higher and richer than the natural order. Or do other intelligent beings in planets far away in other galaxies have no longing for fulfillment, no longing for aspirations to live on eternally? There would be no aspiration to life after death, no longing for a special contact or love from God. The third facet is evil. Towards kinds and degrees of evil, too, we must have an open mind. Evil does not exist necessarily. Being and life and intelligence, from what we can see, are good. Evil need not be a necessary companion. Moreover, if evil does exist elsewhere in the cosmos, it might be of different kinds. A race might be involved in natural disasters, in illnesses and sufferings, floods and tornadoes, or it might be free of all of them. Sin in one race might weaken the personality extensively, as it does on Earth, or it might touch individuals, but not the collectivity, as Christianity believes it does on Earth. It might not infect an entire species on one planet. Finally, it might be that in the universe, a creature's free choice for serious evil is an exception. Although fiction and science on Earth tend to find evil normal. Science fiction in films and television presents, an extra, pre presents extra galactic worlds as hostile and violent and negative. But there's no need to think that evil is more prominent than the goodness of nature or than grace. How interesting that science would tend to be pessimistic and faith would tend to be optimistic. We do not honor God by projecting terrestrial re religion beyond Earth, by presenting the e evil dimensions that we see in our societies and deciding that they must exist everywhere. I'll tell you one thing that we learn from television shows and movies about uh, extraterrestrials and about their activities. There's one thing that comes across in all these television shows and all these movies. Extraterrestrials hate New York City. <laughs> so we should be open to a variety of creatures. Now I want to take just a few moments to look briefly at two theologians who, to our surprise, have already thought about this topic. As a Dominican, and here at Ohio Dominican University, it pains me and all of us to say that one of them is a Franciscan and the other is a Jesuit. Guillaume Vaurion was a Franciscan. He lived in the first 60 years of the 1400s. He taught at the University of Paris, and he was a theologian at the Ecumenical Council of Basel. Vaurion began by saying that God could create a vast number of worlds, worlds like our own, or worlds, he said, better than ours. Quote, infinite worlds, more perfect than this one, lie hid in the mind of God. It is possible that the species of each of these worlds is quite different from those of our world. The insightful theologian pondered what would revelation, sin, and a redeemer, like Jesus, be on another world. He says, if it be inquired whether people existing on that world would have sinned, as Adam and Eve did, I answer no. They would not necessarily have contracted sin because their species is not from Adam and Eve. He means that they wouldn't have the inclinations of our race by birth which leads us to so easily be involved in things that are sinful. What is the role of Jesus Christ in these other planets? Vaurion's answer was nuanced. 
If different kinds of sin are hypothetical, then different kinds of redemption are also hypothetical. He writes, as to the question whether Christ by dying on this earth could redeem the inhabitants of another world, I answer, he was able to do this, not only for our world, but for infinite worlds. But it's not fitting for him to go to another world to redeem them. He means that the incarnate word, second person of the Trinity, by its power, can exercise as wide a redemption as it wants. But that the man Jesus does, uh, refers to planet Earth. How interesting and surprising. Already at the end of the Middle Ages, at the beginning of the Renaissance, we have a basic theology of extraterrestrials. The second theologian is the famous Jesuit Karl Rahner. In 1974, he mentioned what he called the possible history of, of Geist, of intelligence and freedom on another star. He wrote, can we conceive of creatures on other stars who are corporeal and intellectual like human beings and similar to them? The gigantic number of stars argues for this, he says. Rahner, 40 years ago, in a challenging way, asked, why in worlds where life is a potentiality or a dynamic reality, why would God stop the development of life short of intelligent life? Towards the end of his life, in 1981, the Jesuit theologian wrote a longer reflection. Today, the possibility of the development of life to the point of intelligence cannot be excluded. He says, it would be excessively anthropomorphic to view the creator God as directing cosmic evolution at another location in the universe to the point where the immediate possibility of free and intellectual life is present and then casually stopping the development. Why? For Rahner, the active self-seeking person draws forth from God inevitably a richer contact, what Jesus calls the kingdom of God. Would there not be for each civilization of extraterrestrials some kind of revelation and grace as the special self-communication of God? He thinks so. We presuppose, therefore, that the goal of the world consists in God communicating himself to it. We presuppose that the whole dynamism which God has instituted at the very heart of the world's becoming is always meant as a beginning and the first step towards the divine giving of itself. Rahner expects that a special presence of grace comes to others on other planets. Quote, one could say that these other corporeal and intelligent creatures in a meaningful way also have a supernatural determination with an immediacy to God. At the same time, we can conclude nothing about how the history of the freedom and the intelligence and the grace in others unfold. Christian theology should accept the limitations of its revelation and religion as they are on earth. Rahner concludes, a theologian can hardly say more about this issue than to indicate that Christian revelation has as its goal the salvation of the human race. It does not give answers to questions which do not in an important way actually touch the realization of this salvation on earth in freedom. Today we've gathered to celebrate St. Thomas Aquinas and although he lived a long, long time ago, he has a contribution to make in this. It's in terms of incarnation. For Aquinas, God is not a sup static supreme being. He's not a transcendent deity. God is an all active reality who is vastly different from us. God is not one lofty being watching us all the time, but a being who is realized in endless activity. Aquinas writes, God is a living fountain, a fountain that is never diminished, in spite of the fountain's continuous flow outwards into beings and realities. 
Aquinas asked, what led God to create? God doesn't need anything. He doesn't exist lonely in darkness in a cosmic night. The divine was motivated to create by generosity. For Aquinas, God is goodness, and beings that are good, endlessly good, are generous. He writes, God is most generous to the highest degree. The divine motive for both creation and incarnation, the word coming to uh, Bethlehem and becoming a human being like us, is the unlimited goodness and generosity of God. There is an incarnation of the word of God in Jesus also for the same reason. God is generous and is good. The incarnation is also an act of divine generosity. The incarnation is not some kind of a freak show by which uh, Jesus is taller or better looking than everybody else. It's rather that the second person of the Trinity becomes somebody who is like us. Aquinas made an interesting marginal observation in his theology of the incarnation. So his theology of generosity from God and of the divine being, being interested in more and more and more realities and beings, that tends to support what we've been looking at this morning, doesn't it? But he also made an interesting marginal observation when he treated the incarnation of the word in Jesus Christ. Jesus appears to some Christians as totally identical with the word of God. So the reality of Jesus of Nazareth, who lives at a particular time, comes into existence uh, 4 BC, who is it's very unlikely that he's taller than five feet six, and he thinks backwards because he thinks uh, out of the Hebrew mindset. The incarnation of the word in Jesus is, sets Jesus apart from the word. The whole point of incarnation is not that Jesus would be a shell or a casing for the divine. It would be just the opposite, that the divine becomes someone who's like us. St. Paul likes to say this over and over again, like us in everything. Other Christians imagine that Jesus is simply a body containing God. That, too, is heretical. For a careful thinker like Aquinas, the humanity of Jesus of Nazareth remains limited, very limited, minute, compared to the all-powerful and empowering word of God. Quote, the power of a divine person is infinite and cannot be limited to anything created. Could the word of God be incarnate in creatures other than Jesus of Nazareth? Aquinas said yes. An incarnation on this particular planet is only one divine activity. It can be all kinds of divine activities. God is not enclosed in the man Jesus of Nazareth. It's impossible for the created, Aquinas writes, to be circumscribed by the, it's impossible for the uncreated to be circumcised, circumscribed by the created. Whether we look at the divine power itself or its personhood, the divine person can assume more than one intelligent creature. Incarnation involves one creature as the object of that one special divine revelation. It hardly presents all that God can and is doing. Is not incarnation, in fact, like creation, a cosmic form of God's love? To conclude, some of us are familiar with C.S. Lewis's novels about the solar system, science fiction novels, so Paralandra, Out of the Silent Planet. They consider these very topics. Is there sin on another planet? Uh, what does it mean to have salvation history in a larger framework? Around the same time that C.S. Lewis was writing these novels, there was a British poet. 
Her name was Alice Maynell. In 1913, she wrote a poem about incarnation as having cosmic dimensions. It's really extraordinary. She writes, but in the eternities, doubtless we shall compare together here a million gospels in what guise he trod the Pleiades, the lyre, the bear. Be prepared, my soul, to read the inconceivable, to scan the million forms of God those stars unroll, when in our turn we show to them a man. So let's hear that once more time because it's so unusual. In the eternities, so there's lots of eternities for the different galaxies and planets. Doubtless we shall compare together. So we shall see the different incarnations, different revelations, a million gospels. In what guise he, the word, the logos, trod the universe of galaxies that she knows, which is the, the different uh, systems of the signs of the zodiac, the Pleiades, the lyre, the bear. Be prepared to read the inconceivable, to scan a million forms of God. So she has the idea that the persons of the Trinity might become incarnate in a million forms, whose stars unroll. So there would be a vast array of incarnations of the persons of the Trinity, and we have one to show along with all the others. Quite remarkable for 1913. So I was an amateur reading in books with spectacular illustrations about clusters in the Milky Way of 30,000 stars or clusters of galaxies, each with tens of billions of stars. After the years uh, passed, I came not just to the conclusion that there is somewhere another race of knowing and free people like us. Doesn't that seem obvious because of the vast size of the universe? But four or five years ago, a further challenge lodged itself in my mind, a shock. It would seem that there must be many such civilizations. There must be many civilizations of intelligence and culture in the past, in the present, and in the future. The billions of galaxies with billions of solar systems seems to make this inevitable. I think that God invites us to these reflections. It's not our responsibility on earth to manage or to limit the number of beings God created or the kinds of intelligence or of divine presence that God can fashion. The Trinity is not afraid of the universe it created. Thank you.